Good morning. Um, just I was going to quickly talk about um, the, red, the red zone stuff in terms of the housing. Um, so far we've done, um, we've, if you like, purchased 10 houses and we're expected to purchase another 34. So 34 transactions we expect to complete um, next week. Um, so in terms, and then we've, there's, a, there's about 800 people have selected an option. So they're actually you know, right in, in the process. Uh, 378 have gone with option one. If you like, we buy, um, we're buying it for you know, the house and land value. And then there's uh, 563, which have gone with option two. There's about um, 85 people have requested to be fast-tracked. So these are people who may have health issues or they've purchased another house. And of those 85, 65 have already, um, we've worked through already. Um, we've also had people asking for their properties to be rechecked, whether they're gonna be read or, you know, they're saying that it doesn't quite make sense. So there's 300 in that category. And then there's also 286 people who are currently um, green wanting to be orange or red. And then there's 26 who are red who want, to be, who want to be green. So more people tend to want to be green than red, than red who don't want to be green. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of get the idea. More people want to be red than want to be green from people in those areas. Does that not send you all, all, send you all mad? Um, orange zone stuff. Um, the orange zone is something around 9,000 households. I think there was some confusion. People think we could actually, um, the, some people in the orange area were a bit welcome, Minister. Um, I think that we've, we've got about 9,000 in that, in that orange zone, um, and we've put out a timetable for that. We haven't met the timetable in some cases, and that's really about us working through the engineering issues. Um, and for the people who we have let them, who we haven't actually met that timetable, we've said we're going to get out to them, is it next week, in the next few weeks, giving them an update on the time frame. But we're very aware people want to get that information as quickly as possible. Our issue is we're making the, these decisions, they're very long-term decisions, and we have to do them right. And while we want the information quickly, they're not going to thank us if we make an incorrect decision, and in a year's time or five years' time, the land collapses or some other issue, some other issue occurs. Um, I went to a function last night at Tonkin and Taylor. They've still got about 100 engineers out there in the field every day doing this land assessment work. In addition to that, there's about another 100 surveyors out there doing surveying work. And then in addition to that, there's the people processing the LIDAR stuff, and most of them are actually in India because they've got this process where you do the LIDAR, you've then got to look at every single pixel and then go through and try and work out whether that height is actually about the height of a tree or whether it's actually the ground. So that actually has to be done manually and they're using, they're using a company in India to do that. Um, just moving on, we, we, um, we are going to do some, some workshops for people in the red zone. People to understand about, you know, work out whether they should be buying or renting or what they should be doing. And we're doing those in the next two weeks beginning on, in fact, beginning on the 3rd of October. We're going to run separate sessions for older people, but also for the Korean and Chinese communities. And if there are other particular communities who think they've got particular needs, we're happy to run them, run them for them as well. Um, bus tours, we're looking, we've, we hope within uh, a couple of weeks to come out and just tell you about what our plans are for the bus tours. But we think there is a very strong need and a really strong desire for people to get out there and have a, have a look. We're not sure whether people will be able to get off the bus, but certainly people, people, you know, people just want to be able to just see what's happening in there. In May we'd actually we'd started planning these, but these, these were stopped once we had that June shake. Um, but we hope to get on with those as quickly as we can. But you know, obviously public safety is going to be key there. And we're also just thinking about making sure as we run those we meet the needs of families first of all. So there are some families who probably want to have, spend some time family and friends, so they'll, they'll be given the priority. Um, just quickly working through um, demolitions. Um, I think we think there's something like 1,200 buildings that need to come down. We're now, um, today, at something like 586 buildings have either been completely demolished or partially demolished. So we're nearly at that halfway stage. Um, and in terms of significant buildings, do people want to hear quick about the significant buildings? Yeah. Should I do that? Okay. Grand Chancellor, it's still been propped ready for the removal of the roof and the cladding. All the guest luggage is gone, but some of the staff um, possessions are still to go. The car park is um, the car park, which is the next door building. That's nearly complete. 
Um, the Copthorne, Copthorne Durham. The stop soft strip out is underway and the roof section will be removed within the next two weeks. Clarendon, um, tenders have gone out and they close off on the 6th of October. Um, discussions are continuing between the owner and the insurance company, but we've got that tender out there. We want to get on with this just as soon as we can. We don't want to be held up by people pricing the job. But typically, a job like that, you know, if it's a $100 million building, it's going to cost about $10 million to bring it down. It gives you a feeling for the scale of that thing. You know, it's about 10% of the cost. To bring down a building is about 10% of the cost of bringing it, which is why you just can't sort of decide tomorrow you're going to do it. Write some notes down on the back of paper and say, go and just go and pull it down. It's actually it's quite a complex process. Clarendon, um, we've talked about the Clarendon. Gallery Apartments, um, demolition, that, that's the building right next to the art gallery. Demolition there will start within the next two weeks. The cathedral, various parts, including the bells, have now been removed. Um, and the future of the building is still being discussed by, by the Anglican Church. The Catholic Cathedral, the stabilisation work is pretty much complete there. And um, it's really also with the church there deciding what their next step is going to be. Farmers, the farmers building the car park, that is also being assessed, further engineering assessments. But we hope to get some, some answers to that pretty soon. Convention Centre. Tenders will go out on that soon. Um, the City Council have asked us to run that process for them. Um, the Westpac Tower and the Crown Plaza, tenders are about to go out. And the Forsyth Bar, that's still being assessed. The last thing I was going to quickly talk about was the long-term recovery strategy. We've got meetings starting off um, on this Sunday night. We'll be talking to the community about that, getting people's feedback. Um, we're also starting the process of talking to our other partners, um, the City Council. ECAN, WIMAC, Selwyn, Naitahu. So that process is getting underway uh, next week. Well, thank you, Roger. I, I think um, you can get a sense from uh, Roger's sort of uh, contribution there that there is an awful lot of work underway uh, and that the pace of the recovery is, is uh, moving at a, at a, a very good speed. Um, we're now starting to talk more about uh, what we do uh, in recovery as opposed to uh, response to the uh, event itself and I think that's a very very positive uh, position to have got to. Um, all I have to report is that uh, the Cashel Mall uh, uh, temporary or heart of the city retailing complex uh, has been consented under section 444 of the SERA Act uh, and is on target for the opening in time for uh, show weekend. Um, Yesterday, uh, Roger signed on behalf of Sarah the Alliance Agreement, um, and you probably covered those stories, but I don't think anyone can uh, under anticipate or underestimate really how very important that um, signing was as a, as a moving forward, making sure that we get quality infrastructure, horizontal infrastructure back into the city as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, I could also report that the first consent has been granted for a new building in the red zone, uh, the Harcourt's Grenadier building, which was uh, uh, in Madras Street, uh, destroyed by the earthquake, um, has been redesigned, or a new building has been designed and a consent has been issued uh, for that construction. I'm uncertain of what the timelines are around that, uh, but it indicates the um, willingness for people to get back into the central city as quickly as possible. On the um, that it's an eco-friendly building, this one. Um, the, uh, the, um, on the land settlement issue, the Crown has settled so far 10 properties, uh, with a further 29 uh, to be settled this coming week, uh, and uh, a further th uh, 329 to be settled over the next month. So very good progress there, at a, at a quite an orderly pace, meaning that people are taking the time to think carefully about their future and choose options that are uh, for, uh, that are in front, uh, that could be available to them. Uh, Roger and the team are considering to continuing to ex to assess uh, housing land availability uh, and our intention is that uh, new subdivision areas will be seismically very sound uh, and uh, that those those subdivisions will be able to put in place be put in place very very quickly. Uh, the commitment is to have a large number of sections, I think 2,500 or so, on the market by December of this year. Uh, they may not be all built, but they'll certainly be on the market, uh, with a much larger number of sections available by the end of uh, 2012. Um, 
the the uh, advice that will come to uh, to through Sarah will be about how the Sarah powers can be used to remove regulatory roadblocks. But I have to say that uh, we do have considerable cooperation in that regard uh, from the Christchurch City Council. Uh, Roger mentioned the draft long-term recovery strategy, and uh, I just simply encourage people to get hold of that uh, and make any comments about it that they wish, uh, so that it can be considered in the, the final document. Uh, last points have to be around the issue of insurance, which has been topical uh, in the last day or so. Um, uh, I can tell you that I spoke directly to very senior executives, if not the chief executive, of the five largest reinsurance companies in the world. Each of those companies indicated that they have capital available to continue uh, reinsuring pri primary insurance in New Zealand uh, for the future. Uh, the issue that is current is how long does the current risk period uh, continue for? And what they have all said is that as the decay curve for the three faults that we're dealing with in New Zealand falls down uh, month after month after month, uh, then they will look to re-enter the market with further expansion of capital. So the very important point is, if people have got insurance now, it will be there in the future. The issue for Canterbury particularly is the expansion of the insurance market, and my instinct tells me that that is not too far off. I think the um, uh, uh, comments that came out of the Insurance Council yesterday uh, are interesting. Uh, but I note that none of those comments have come from any single insurance company in New Zealand. And I'd say very, very clearly that if there is an insurance, council out, uh, insurance company out there firing the insurance council up to make these sort of statements, they need to get out from behind the blanket organisation and say who they are. Because until you have individual insurers stepping up to say that they no longer want to be in our market, I don't believe the Insurance Council position is credible, particularly because of the personal discussions I've had with those chief executives of reinsurance companies over the last couple of weeks. Um, I think it's very important that we don't uh, overhype this or put out a, a scaremonger situation. And I think um, uh, New Zealanders have been uh, loyal purchasers of insurance for a large number of years. Insurance companies are risk-based. They effectively, through the price they charge, buy your risk. And uh, as you would look at the, the level of risks that exist throughout the world for these big companies, <coughs> New Zealand currently sits at eighth on that list and likely to fall because earthquake is not an annual event. It's a rare event. Uh, and so being able to connect those companies to GNS and the international science that's going, around, going on around the assessment of the seismic events in Christchurch uh, will help better modelling, uh, and they certainly welcome that, uh, that uh, interaction in the discussions that I had.